Okay, welcome to Thursday, December 9. This is our class session for multivariable calculus at Delta College. We are wrapping up our program now. Let's get some things out of the way. And this is the last presentation of new material that we'll bring in the course, very famous theorem called Gauss's theorem. It is the second extension of Green's theorem to space. It's the extension of the flux form. I have a handout that I'll run past you and that you should read carefully at your own pace and schedule. But I just want to remind you that our program for next week, complete your final homework. We'll do review sessions in class and you'll be working on exam three. I remember our exam three schedule is a little bit different than our exam schedule for the first two exams. Our first two exams were Tuesdays to Tuesdays. I have to hand in grades very promptly on the following Tuesday. So we've set this exam to be Saturday to Saturday. Exam three will be released by 11.59 p.m. on this Saturday, which is December 11. It will be due seven days later in the ordinary fashion on our uh, website, there's the Dropbox link. You will be working on your last two homework problems at the same time. They'll be due on, why don't we just pull that up? Get rid of the clutter on the desktop. Let's pull that up and share with you. They'll be due Tuesday of that week, which is December 14. And that's a little bit unavoidable that you'll be having the homework in your hand and the exam in your hand at the same time. I'd like you to be able to concentrate on your exam undistracted. So if it was within your power, I think you want to consider getting these last two homework problems out of the way quickly. So you're handing in a homework problem tonight from 6-7. This refers to Stokes theorem. These last two examples that we'll uh, have you hand in from 6-8, Gauss's theorem. If you can work on those as quickly as possible, then we will be able to, you know, you'll be able to give your undivided attention to the test. Now, I'm not gonna accelerate the deadline on those problems. So they'll still be due on Tuesday, December 14. I'll give everybody the full time to do that. And I won't post solutions then till after that deadline is passed. So you will have your return papers as quickly as possible. And you will have the solutions posted to those problems if you want to review or use them. But if you have the majority of those problems ironed out before that Tuesday, you know, as soon as possible, before that exam is released, then you can give your undivided attention to the exam. Other than that, there's no difference. I anticipate the exam will have five questions. I haven't finished it yet. It should be just like any other exam. It covers chapter six only. So you get to concentrate a little more on the topics of chapter six, but you've been focused on them for these last several weeks. So you should be able to study and proceed exactly like you did for the first two exams. Okay, let me stop sharing that. Let's go back to our paper and then we'll get started. Uh, I did read and post your graded papers for the most recent two homeworks, which were some pretty intense integrals calculation wise. And, and there's always more than one way to finish an integral, to evaluate an integral. So, even on your papers, you showed me one or two methods I didn't choose. So you do have freedom to evaluate integrals as you are led by various techniques, but consider, please review the integration techniques that I demonstrated in the posted solutions, because I think that people underestimate how powerful the trigonometric substitutions are, how neatly that simplifies things. None of this work is simple or neat, but look at the 
integration techniques I used in those two problems. The second problem that you most recently did was notable because it included an improper integral, uh, depending on how you presented it. It might have looked something like this. Or maybe it had other limits and looked something like this. This depends on your parameterization. Now, you have to remember what improper integral means. Improper integral means you either have infinite limits or you have an integrand, a function that approaches infinite values. So in any case like this, these are just two different writings that I saw on that problem. Uh, you cannot take it for granted that this is a finite number. I'm sorry, let me move that paper up. A new camera rig here. So I'm not used to how close it is to the paper. Do not forget any of the previous things you learned. The, these things like this are improper integrals. You cannot take it for granted they're finite. So even if part of your integration turns out to be zero, zero times infinity is not necessarily zero, as you learned in calculus one. So you have to establish, if you run across an improper integral, you have to establish that it, what language did you use? That it converges. An improper integral, you have to establish that it actually adds up to a finite number. The, the formal word was converges. Before you can use it in a calculation, you can't use an abstraction in a calculation. The concept of infinity is not a number. The concept of infinity is an abstraction of what happens if you let numbers grow without bound. So you cannot use that to perform the ordinary arithmetic. You can't say that infinity times zero is necessarily zero. Silliest example, of course is the limit as x goes to plus infinity of x times one over x. Now, the second term is clearly going to zero. The first term is clearly going to infinity. But in this case, infinity times zero actually turns out to be one because of the ratio of these two concepts. And if I altered that ratio, I could make that limit something else, or I could make that limit even not exist. In this case, I still have the second term going to zero and the first term going to plus infinity, but this time the limit is equal to one over x is equal to zero as x goes to plus infinity. Remember, you have to evaluate this term as much as possible before you execute the limit. So here I've got infinity times zero being two different things. And you know, or you can guess now, that if I wanted to create something infinite, I could just say x squared times one over x. And this limit is in fact infinite. So that's a kind of a silly, silly example, but it focuses your attention on the fact that you cannot take any infinite value for granted. Infinity times zero could be one or zero or infinity. I say infinity times zero here in quotes because we don't multiply with infinities. Now there's a small caveat. Maybe you'll take a future math class where you learn how to do that in a proper fashion, but this is not that class. So we're concentrating on the properties of real numbers. Okay, so thank you for your attention to that, but please review some of the integration techniques that I've demonstrated. Uh, I'm not perfect at demonstrating them, but in particular, practice your trigonometric substitutions. Okay, so now let's move on to Gauss's theorem statement. And then after that, we'll do some examples. It's a pretty 
straightforward extensions. It's a little bit less distracting than Stokes theorem extension. Stokes theorem extension used curl and parallel pipette and some kind of uh, more fancy geometry. Here for the Gauss's theorem, let me pull out the handout that I have posted online. I'm just bringing up a local copy so that I don't have to wait for something to download. Here in Gauss's theorem, it's a little more direct. So let me share this paper with you. There we go. So this is the extension of Green's theorem, divergence form to space. So let's pretend that you have in your hand a potato. Here's a potato right here. And you want to examine, this is in the presence of a field F, field F right here. You want to examine how much field is entering or leaving that potato or the net amount of field entering or leaving that potato. Well, we know the calculus way. We know the way of calculus. And so the concept is gonna be, we're gonna dice that potato up into little cubes. If you've ever, if you enjoy cooking or playing around in the kitchen, dice this potato up into little cubes and we're going to fry each little potato cube. No, we're going to add up how much field enters or leaves each little cube, dv. And we can do that very much like we did the Green's theorem flux form, divergence form handout. And then think of that little q and the three dimensions that are encountered by the three pairs of sides. I'm not going to go through this calculation with you. But if you sum up what happens on the six sides of that cube, you see something that looks remarkably like a partial derivative of f, the first component of the field with respect to x, g, the second component of the field with respect to y, and h, the third component of the field with respect to z. Now, Remember, the book likes to use the components of the field as P and Q or P and Q and R. And on this handout, I'm using F, G, and H. But you recognize that to be the divergence of the field times a little volume element if you rearrange this properly. So in that sense, remember, divergence is flux density, the amount of field flowing into or out of a little cube. And then to make the argument complete, we say we will examine all the little cubes and things that flow out of one little cube flow into the next little cube and vice versa. So those things cancel out interior to the potato. And the only thing that's left that doesn't cancel out is the little cubes along the outside of the potato, the very tiny little cubes. And so I end up calculating when I sum the divergence over the volume of the potato, G, I end up calculating really the amount of field that flows out of that potato. Now I want to remind you of the other notation conventions I'm using. So besides F, G, and H on this handout, I used G for the solid potato. I used sigma for the boundary surface of the potato. And we're using n for an outward normal to sigma, the boundary of the potato. OK, so read the rest of the Santa. This is all that I have here. And just satisfy yourself that those calculations actually are reasonable. This is not a proof. It's an argument. It's a rationalization. But let's demonstrate this in real life. Now, before I go away from this handout, I want to remind you of this thing that we've said a couple times now. Remember, all of the theorems we talked about, Green's theorem, both forms, Stokes' theorem, and now Gauss's theorem, 
it offers you an equality between two multiple integrals or between a line integral and a multiple integral. This means that the left-hand side of this equation can be calculated by calculating the right-hand side. The right-hand side can be calculated by calculating the left-hand side. They're fully equal. And on any one problem, if you want to know the value of the left side, but the right side is easier to calculate, then you go ahead and do that. If you want to know the value of the right side, but the left side is easier to calculate, you go ahead and do that. When the problem asks you to verify Gauss's theorem or Stokes theorem or Green's theorem, verify means literally they want you to calculate both sides and show that they're equal. They want you to develop confidence in the formula. Okay, so let's pick out some examples today. That's all we want to do is look at some examples. I'm gonna get out of this handout now. This handout's on our website if you want to review it later. And let's pick out an example, something kind of mellow to start, and then we'll work up to more complicated one. And if I can demonstrate a parameterization of a surface in an appropriate fashion, maybe we will do that later, but the best examples I've given you are on the homework. Uh, this, this, by the way, this theorem is also commonly called the divergence theorem, but I think, I think it's appropriate to honor Gauss by referring to it as Gauss's theorem. So just be flexible. It's used in different contexts in science and mathematics, and that's why people have different notations and different names. So I'm looking for something solid bounded by cylinder. Let's just pick something mellow like exercise 381. Because this is a good demonstration of the shortcut nature of this. This is section six, eight. Let's assemble it here. There's nothing picture to show you. Uh, you could demonstrate some of these pictures in Mathematica too, but first let's practice the calculation. So we have a field and the field is three dimensional field, X comma Y comma Z squared minus one. Book has a habit of presenting this in unit vector notation, the IJK notation. I prefer the bracket notation myself. S is the surface of the solid bounded by the cylinder such and the plane such and such. So now we have S bounded by x squared plus y squared equals four, z equals zero, and z equals one. This is a fully appropriate way to describe the surface, but it's not a parameterization of the surface, and that's the subtlety you've developed over the course. G, let's call it G right here, the solid, be the solid, enclosed by S. So let's do a small picture and then we'll work up to the calculations. Three dimensional space oriented by the right hand rule, X axis cross into the Y axis gives you the Z axis. <coughs> this cylinder is radius two. So let's mark something that could be radius two. Kind of trying to draw a circle in perspective on the tabletop. And then it will be height one. So it's going to advance one unit high. 
So it's kind of a solid disk. It has two units of radius and one unit of height. Ooh, kind of a small cheese, kind of a baby bell, kind of a baby cylinder. And I kind of, I'm a cheese fan. Okay, so we see right away, let's write down Gauss's theorem. I can calculate the flux of this field through S, or I can calculate the divergence of this field throughout the volume of the potato G. So it's hard for me to make this notation, but G is the inside of this little wheel and S is the surface. Already I formed an opinion about which is easier to do. Because do you understand that the surface S that encloses this wheel of cheese is three surfaces. It's the outside cylinder, the top roof and the bottom roof. That means S is composed of three different surfaces. I'm going to have to parameterize three things, three normals, three flux integrals. I don't look forward to doing that. I would choose not to do that if I could. Now, the problem might give me some simplification in the field that maybe all three of those double integrals are not bad. Maybe two of them are really nice, and I only have to do work on one. But why do three double integrals? If I could get away with just doing one triple integral, So the problem asked me to calculate the surface integral S, F dot N DS. But that doesn't mean I have to parameterize and calculate here. I could calculate this instead. So this doesn't seem to be a problem where I do both. I don't think I want to demonstrate doing three things on this side. Although maybe we'll look at it for a second. Let's calculate. The divergence. Of F. Over G. Move to the next paper. Keep this up here for just a second. So we can assemble our pieces. Well, the divergence of this field is partial x, partial x, plus partial y, partial y, plus partial z squared minus one partial z. These are the three components of the field. And they're not difficult to deal with. One plus one plus two z. So that's two plus two z. And now I'm faced with this triple integral. Now I have to choose how I'm going to set up the triple integral and I have to do the limits. So setting up limits on a triple integral was not a trivial task, but if I choose my coordinate system wisely, it's not so bad. So you say, why would a triple integral be easier to do than a double integral? Well, here the answer is because you have to do three double integrals to find this flux. So let's just set up one triple integral. I think it seems reasonable that I'm going to use cylindrical coordinates. Remember, cylindrical coordinates, you have your choice of the order you integrate, but it's often dz, dr, d theta. Because if you have cylindrical symmetry, theta is usually the silliest thing to state, you know, full circle, half circle, quarter circle. It's easily stated in constant terms. Remember, excuse me, move this over. 
the first limit right here will be zero to two pi because this is a full wheel of cheese. So I go zero to two pi around the z-axis. The radius to describe this solid wheel of cheese will always range from zero to two, no matter what theta I pick. There's another constant limit that makes me feel comfortable. And in fact, the z limit is constant. For every r and theta I pick, the z will always go from zero to one. So this wheel of cheese just screams to be evaluated in cylindrical coordinates. And I'm just evaluating a polynomial here. I think we're gonna be done with this pretty darn quick. So I evaluate and say two z plus z squared, z value from zero to one. I didn't write z equals zero, z equals one. If I understand what variable I'm substituting into, substituting into, oh, wait a minute, what did we forget? We forgot our little r here, didn't we? That's the price of going to cylindrical coordinates. Easy to forget because with respect to the first integral, this r is a constant. So I can just leave it outside and evaluate the integration with respect to z. But if you're not getting a sensible answer, make sure you've included all parts of your integral. I thought I was gonna get away with just doing one integration. I will have to integrate with respect to r. Okay, moving on. Let's save some vertical space here. So when I plug in one and zero, when I plug in one, I get two plus one. When I plug in zero, I get nothing. And two plus one is three. And now I can evaluate with respect to r and theta. So this is three r squared over two from r equals zero to two. d theta. And when I plug in two, I get six. Three times four over two is six. When I plug in zero, I get nothing. So this is just the integral from zero to two pi of six with respect to theta. And you're not gonna do anything fancy or machine oriented with this. This is just a brick that's six units high and two pi units wide. So the result is 12 pi. Now notice that 12 pi is a positive number. So field, must be, net field must be flowing out of this cheese. So I write this over here. And you say, well, how do you know it's flowing out? Maybe the normals that you selected for the surface were inward. I didn't select any normals for the surfaces. Gauss's theorem says that the divergence calculates the flux with respect to the outward normals. I don't have to worry about what direction these normals are when I'm using the divergence. Gauss's theorem calculates the outward flux. So this positive 12 pi that we calculated means more field is leaving this cheese than entering this cheese. Now, I don't think I'm pretty sure I'm not gonna do three surface integrals to confirm this, but I do want to show you that it's not necessarily hard to do the surface integrals because these surfaces, two of the surfaces, the planes are intensely simple, just a level solid plane. So if you want to, that's a strange thing, right? You always meet people and say, if you want to do this, and then they proceed to make you do it. If you want to examine just a part of this flex right here, let's consider the lower surface to be S1. Let's consider the side wall to be S2. And let's consider the top wall, top to be S3. 
So just for practice, let's look at S1, F dot N, DS1. See the pain right here is I have to parameterize that surface, but it's not a very intense surface. And I could parameterize it by simply saying the Z coordinate is zero. And then I could say U V zero, if I just want U and V to represent rectangular coordinates. I could say U cos V, U sine V zero, if I want U and V to represent something polar. But the reason I'm showing this to you is the trap that's about to happen. So let's say you selected a simple polar description of this lower plate, this bottom of the jar, this bottom of the wheel of cheese, and you calculated partial R, partial U, and partial R, partial V, and then their cross product. So partial R, partial U is not complicated. Cosine V, sine V, zero. Partial R, partial V, minus U sine V, U cos V, and zero again. And let's look at partial R, partial U cross partial R, partial V. Cross product can't be too bad with a column of zeros right here, sorry. I'll move this, I'll bring the drawing back if we need it. I was trying to do both and that's unreasonable. So I get a zero, I get a zero, opposite of zero, zero, and then I get some interaction in the third slot. Zero, zero. And here I get u cos squared plus u sine squared, I get u. Now the problem is that is not appropriate. Because you look at this U, remember U represents a number between zero and two. This is an upward pointing normal with respect to that base. And Gauss's theorem calculates the outward flux. Now, I don't want you to panic about that. Let's just do this straight ahead. If the normal I've selected is upward or with respect to the cheese, inward, and that's the opposite direction I want, then what will I do? I'm just going to straight ahead calculate this. And then when I get the number at the end, I'll take the opposite of that number, and that will represent the outward flux. So you don't have to change the parameterization, although you could change the parameterization with some minus signs and such. and redo the calculations, but that's not a good use of your time. So now let's use this parameterization I've set up. Remember the field was x, y, and z squared minus one, but I'll have to remember to take the number that I get out and reverse it to get the outward flux through that portion of the boundary of this wheel of cheese. Okay, so move the paper up a little bit. Let's put this parameterization into the field. And then we'll multiply dot product with partial R, partial U, cross partial R, partial V. And then with respect to the area element of the region of the variables of integration. Now remember, N is a unit normal, but ds is a surface element. So between them, the n and the ds, the magnitude of this cancels out. You're saying, this is not a unit normal. This is a normal of different heights at different places. Well, that's right. But we've already modded out, we've already canceled out that magnitude factor. So this is appropriate calculation. And so let's go du dv, 0 to 2 pi is 0 to 2. And this field, take this 
parameterization plug into the field, what I get is u cos v, u sine v, and minus one. And I'm dotting that with zero, zero, and u. And I selected the order du, dv, dv was the angle representation, zero to two pi. U was the radius representation, zero to two. And this is not a burdensome integral after I've set up the machinery of the parameterization. Zero to two pi, zero to two, minus u du. So when I get this zero to two pi, I could do this geometrically if I like, but we'll do a minus one half u squared from zero to two. This, when I plug in two, gives me a minus two. When I plug in zero, gives me nothing. So this is the integral from zero to two pi, minus two, minus nothing, dv. So this is minus four pi. Now pay attention to what's happening. That's minus four pi with respect to, with respect to, sometimes people abbreviate with respect to in mathematics WRT to save writing, with respect to the inward normal because the normal I set up in my calculation was inward. So what's happening on the bottom of that cheese? Field is flowing out of the bottom of that cheese. And the quantity is four pi. So I have minus four pi inwards, which means I have the flux through S1 of four pi downward, downward with respect to that simple circular disk, outward with respect to the cheese. Now, flowing out of the whole cheese, I have 12 pi total, right? So I've got four pi accounted for. The other two surfaces must account for eight pi. And I'll show you a silly secret because of the simpleness of this thing. Remember, we called S3 the top. Well, the parameterization I used here could equally well have represented the top if instead of zero, I would have put a one here. These partial derivatives would be the same. And this time the unit would be pointing out because it would be going upward. So I'm not gonna do this calculation for you, but you can almost use the same parameterization to do the flux over S3. The only difference is with a one right here, this field would evaluate to U cos V u sine v on the surface and zero. This would be a zero right here. But I'd still be dotting with u u zero. So the dot product would be zero. And I evaluate with respect to u and v. I don't need to do any fancy evaluation here. This is zero. So apparently no net field is flowing into or out of the top of that cheese. Now that makes sense because on the top of that cheese, Z is one. So there's no vertical component to any vector on the top of that cheese. Well, no vertical component to any vector on the top of that cheese means no field is flowing out of that cheese, out or in to that cheese. So you could almost say that by inspection, this flux integral is zero. But before you make a simplification like that, make sure you explain yourself very well. I'm just saying you don't have to be afraid of doing three surface integrals. So that would be zero and four pi. So remains to do the cylinder. 
darn it, you've talked me into it. It remains now just to do the flux through the outside wall of that cheese. And you've talked me into it because the parameterization of the outside wall of that cheese is also going to be very simple. That outside wall, that cheese has a radius of two. So I could select two cosine V, two sine V to represent a circle of radius two. And I could select U to represent height. Now think about that. In the blast parameterization, U represented radius expanding. Here U represents height. Let's see how this calculates. Let's use the R sub U notation for partial R partial U. So derivative with respect to U is zero, zero, one. Derivative with respect to V is minus two sine V, two cos V, and zero. The cross product of these two is two cos V negative And I block out the middle slot, two sine V negative. And I block out the third slot and that's zero. Why should this be something, something zero? Because the normal coming out of the sidewall and the cheese should have no Z component. But I am concerned as to whether this goes inward or outward. Now this time I don't have any Z component to help me orient myself. So how do I determine whether this goes inward or outward? What I have to do is pick just a sample value of V and see where this is going. So for example, at V equals zero, which is representing the angle of zero, representing you're standing on the X axis, Here's my cheese. So V equals zero represents standing on the X axis, no angle deviation from the X axis. What is the value of this vector? It is minus two times one, minus two times zero, and zero. Now with respect to that point, where is that pointing? That is pointing inward. So I'm giving you this warning. When you parameterize a surface, you have to establish the orientation of the normal. Now let's go finish the calculation. But what do I want to happen? I want to find the last eight pi of flux, but now I have an inward normal. So I fully anticipate when I evaluate this, I should get minus eight pi. That's what I'm expecting because that will be minus eight pi inward, which means eight pi outward. So let's check it out over S2. After I didn't intend to verify Gauss's theorem here, but excuse me, this is S2. That's a good, it's good practice. So we're going to insert the parameterization, call this R2 if you like, into the field. And then we're going to dot with this vector minus two cos V, minus two sine V, zero, and then integrate with respect to the area element of this parameterization. I guess I should set this parameterization's parameters, right? The V will go from zero to two pi. And the U here represents height. The U will go from zero to one. So make sure you, that this is important that here U represents the height of the cheese and the previous parameterizations, it represents a variable radius. Okay, so 
what is the key right here for you? The key for you is flexibility. You have to be flexible and aware of what you're representing. Let's put this into the field, which was x, y, z squared minus one. So the x portion of this is two cos v. The y portion of this is two sine v. And the z portion will be u squared minus one. How much trouble is that u squared minus one gonna give me? Apologize, I have to look at my paper more often. Actually, no trouble, because where's my normal? Here's my normal in the parameterization. Here's my NDS minus two cos V minus two sine V and zero. Remember, there's no Z component pointing up or down the surface of that cheese on the outer wall, on the cylinder wall. V goes from zero to two pi, U goes from zero to one. Make sure you have your elements in the right order. But now you see the collapse that you're going to get. You get minus four cos squared, minus four sine squared, and zero. That's just a minus four. And there's no integration to perform here. I just evaluate minus four from zero to one, which gives me minus four. That's just that height and that distance of length one. Of course, it is a negative value, so the net area between that curve and the x-axis, that's, we call that net area negative four. And then we evaluate that from zero to two pi negative eight pi. So it is as I wished. It is as I thought. I have negative eight pi inward, which means eight pi of flux outward. Okay, I think this is what you have to be careful with with Gauss's theorem. Gauss's theorem refers to a shortcut for calculating outward flux. So if you are not setting these surfaces and you are not setting their direction, you don't have to worry. Gauss's theorem has you covered. It naturally calculates outward flux. But if you do parameterize these, because this might be simpler, or you might want to find something that looks like this. If you do parameterize these, you have to make sure that your parameterizations are either outward as intended, or you have to take the opposite of the calculation if your parameterization produced an inward normal. That is the subtlety in Gauss's theorem that sometimes trips people up. Okay, good demonstration. But uh, the other thing you wanted to pay attention to here was that you got a serious break with this field because there was no field flowing out of the top of that cheese. All you had to do is really calculate two surfaces if you observe that. Okay, very good. Uh, we're gonna take a break here too, but let's just at least select a problem that we're gonna do. And I want to, in that, in that problem, what we found was we calculated this in, re, in place of that. It'd be interesting, I'll have to scan the book for a second, if we can find an example of calculating this in place of that. Sometimes you can use Gauss's theorem reverse. Most often you use Gauss's theorem to calculate this to give you flux saves you the trouble of setting the orientations. If you have a closed surface, Gauss's theorem automatically calculates the outward flux. But I think I gave you, well, I'm not gonna prejudice you. Could you, could you ever run across a situation where you'd rather calculate this than this? 
So I'll see if we can pick something out like that. Let me scan that. Why would I rather calculate the left side? Well, I certainly don't want to calculate the left side if I have multiple surfaces, although I got away relatively cheap in the last example. So maybe I'm looking for an example where I can parameterize S with a single parameterization and the most common solid that I can do that for is a solid sphere because a sphere has a surface that I can recover with one parameterization. So is there a flux out of a sphere that I can use to calculate a divergence integral like this? Let me scan this quickly. So I'm looking at problems where I'm calculating sphere. Uh, tetrahedral ones are always fun. Maybe we'll do that also when we come back from the break. Sphere, sphere, I'm looking at 395. I'm looking at 397. Four or two is interesting, but four or two goes in the other direction. Sometimes you can use Gauss's theorem to, when the case of the solid is bounded by two surfaces, to use one surface as a shortcut for the other. So that would also be an interesting demonstration. But just to do the sphere calculation, let's look at 397. I want to see if that gives me a nice thing to evaluate. Yeah. Let's look at 397. We'll set it up. We'll take a break and then we'll come back. And finish the rest of this. So let's say what we have right here is a field. This has got a little T for technology on it. So what I'm expecting is maybe this parameterization is messy. Maybe we'd have a fun time executing the surface integral. And that is one thing I wanted to practice with you, but we just have to take it as it comes. So here's the field Z, X, Y, Z is Y minus two X. Oh, okay, so this is not what I intended, but it might be interesting. X cubed minus Y. Y squared minus Z. This is certainly easier to do the divergence theorem than the surface. And sphere S is a sphere X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared is equal to four. So the solid that I'm talking about is the solid ball, x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus three equal to four. Uh, this is not, this is certainly gonna be easier to calculate the right-hand side than the left-hand side. But maybe we'll do both and I want to find another example going the other way. But the reason why this right-hand side is gonna be easier to calculate is because as I look at the field and calculate its divergence, derivative of the first slot with respect to X minus two, derivative of the second slot with respect to Y minus one, derivative of the third slot with respect to Z minus one, this is a negative four. And then what, is the integral of the divergence of f over this solid sphere. Well, that's the integral over the solid sphere, negative four dv. But remember, when I pull the constant out of integral, any constant I can remove out of this integral, all I've got right here is the volume of the ball. So this is negative four times the volume of this solid ball. 
And I don't need any integral to calculate that volume. The volume of any sphere is four thirds pi r cubed. Here the r is two. And so two cubed is eight. And so let's collect my fours. Okay, so eight times four, 32 times four, 128 with a minus sign. So this integral is minus 128 pi over three. Now remember, what does that mean? That's negative value. So this is calculated with respect to the outward normal. So you are standing on this ball. You are looking up and field is coming at you in the opposite direction. The field is negative 128 pi over three, you know, a little bit more than 128 when you simplify. So field with respect to that normal is negative. The flux with respect to that normal is negative. So actually field is rushing into this ball. If we were to draw the field, the net amount of field must be rushing into this ball. That doesn't mean it's not coming out somewhere, but with respect to the outward unit normal, the net effect is negative. So the net result is more field is flowing into this ball than out of this ball. Now, really, there's nothing left to calculate. Isn't that interesting? I didn't even perform an integration. So there's Gauss's theorem really solidly saving me some time. But I am curious how ugly this parameterization turns out to be. Because what if you tried to calculate the flux straight ahead? Would you get a true appreciation for how much time you saved? I think you already appreciate how much time you saved. But Let's stretch our legs for a second. Let's take a break. And then we'll at least look at the surface integral to see if it's worth trying. Uh, what do we got here? Nine-ish. So we'll come back at 901. I know let's give you a fair time. I'm going to mute my microphone, stretch my legs, and I invite you to do the same. And we'll work out this surface integral and see if we can match it to the shortcut that Gauss's theorem provided. I'll see you in a few minutes.
Okay, we're back. And I'd like to look at the surface integral in this example. And I think, I don't expect it to be any shorter than the calculation we just did, but I think I'd like to pull it out because it might be an interesting mixture of trigonometric functions. And I don't know if it'll be a super excellent demonstration, but I wanted you to practice evaluating multiple integrals and evaluating when your parameterization is about trigonometric functions. So let's take a look at that. First, I'm trying to put my stuff away there. Okay, good deal. So let's evaluate for this problem. Let's evaluate f dot n ds. I'll just restart this and then I'll come down here. On the recent homework that I read, uh, you did a nice job of evaluating some things with spherical coordinates. And since this is a sphere, this cries out for spherical coordinates. You can parameterize the whole ball with one shot. And uh, I tend to think sometimes first go-to transformation is polar. You could do this polar cylindrical transformation, but here cylindrical is the, I'm sorry, spherical is the simplest way to do things. Now remember just a quick refresher course on spherical. If you have X, Y, and Z, this is rectangular. Then you have R cos theta, R sine theta, and Z. If you go to cylindrical, and that comes from this triangle in the plane, x, y, excuse me, and r. But if you go to spherical, you can calculate the standing triangle, which is z, r for the base and phi in the upper corner here. And this tells you that r, I'm sorry, that rho, r over rho is sine phi. So r is rho sine phi. And z, is rho cos phi. And the r right here that I'm going to replace is also rho sine phi. So I only mention this drawing to help you remember. If you can't remember this transformation, you don't have to look it up. You can build it from the triangles. You could look it up too. But you can always build the progression to spherical coordinates through these two triangles in the plane that we set up, these two right triangles. So here we have a sphere of radius what? Two? R squared is four, so radius is two. So I'll just write this as two sine. And remember now, I traditionally use phi and theta for spherical coordinates, but I also have this habit, you don't have to follow it, that I make my variables in parameterizations neutral variables. I don't have them referring to any particular quantity. So if I use u and v for the variables here, I have to decide which one's going to be theta and which one's going to be phi. And that's no particular issue. I did use v to stand for theta in previous problems. So why don't we say 2 sine u cosine v. 2 sine u, sine v, and 2 cos u. You could name them otherwise, but make sure you got this straight, that the u 
it's playing the role of the phi. So that's going to go from zero to pi. And the V is playing the role of theta. That's going to go from zero to two pi. You have freedom to name these as you wish, as long as you're consistent. So these will be the variable parameters. Okay, so now we got to do the partial R partial U plus partial R partial V. So that also I already know, but I'll execute it so you can see it. So derivative with respect to U will be two cos U cos V, two cos U sine V, and derivative with respect to U minus two sine u. Now the derivative with respect to v will be derivative of cosine v is minus sine v, so minus 2 sine u sine v. Derivative of sine v is cosine v, so 2 sine u cos v. And the derivative of the third slot with respect to v is zero. There's no v here in the third slot. Okay, there's a slight happiness there. See how that reduces my work. It's not too much. So now let's look at the cross product. And I'll tease you again. I already know what this cross product's gonna turn out to be. If I was doing its magnitude, but let's see if that matches what we get as a result. So I block out the first slot and I just pick up zero minus this quantity. So that comes to be a positive four sine squared u cosine b. Then I block out the second, which is this downward minus this downward, but I take the opposite of that. So that works out to be there's a negative sign right there. Don't see it very nicely, do you? So that works out to be also positive four sine squared u sine v. And then the full thing hit me right here. I get four sine u cos u, but cos squared v, there's my saving ticket. And then here, subtract negative means positive four sine u cos u sine squared v. What I get is the combination of cos squared plus sine squared give me one. So I just get four sine u cos u. Now I said I knew what this was gonna turn out to be, but in order to do that, I'd have to execute the magnitude. And remember the magnitude of this should be rho squared sine phi. Why is that? Because that's the Jacobian of the coordinate transformation. So if I executed the magnitude on this, I should get four sine, which one's playing the role of phi? U, I should get four sine U. And you see that that's what you'll get if you execute the magnitude, square, square, square. You get four sine squared U cos squared U. Here you get 16 sine fourth U, but cos squared P plus sine squared V, give you a one, so you get 16 sine to the fourth u. Here you had 16 sine squared u. After you factor out the 16 sine squared u, you'll just get another sine squared u, cos squared u, sum is one. Then you'll be taking the square root of 16 sine squared u, which will give you four sine u. You can check that out, but this gives me confidence that I'm doing the right thing. Now the question is, is this inward or outward? Always check that when you're doing a parameterization, which way your normal is pointing. So I'm gonna have to select some, I cannot see this easily right here. I'm gonna select a, a value of u and check out the z. No, because on a ball, the Z could be upward or the Z could be downward. In both cases, it's out. So what I have to do is I have to select the U and V and see where I'm seriously looking on this thing. And that means I have to know where I am when I select the U and V. 
So which way do you want to do it? Let's, we could select the North Pole. We could select the thing on the outside axis. Let's, what happens at the North Pole? The North Pole must be when U is zero, because that's playing the role, the U is playing the role of phi. So this could be when U is zero. And what could that be for V? It could be V is anything, but that itself is a distraction. Because if I select u equals zero and v equals zero, I report a zero in the first slot because of the sine squared u. I report a zero in the second slot, either from the sine squared u or the sine v, and I report a zero in the third slot from the sine u. So my parameterization, oh, okay. Uh, no, no, that that's okay. That that's that what I said is true. There, my parameterization is having a zero magnitude normal right there. How about over here on the x-axis? Then I come down and say u is pi over two because I've come halfway down. And let's say v is what zero. Does that give me an indication of my normal? So when u is pi over two, then sine of u is one, sine squared of u is one, four, one, one. That would give me a unit normal of four. And then sine squared u sine v, that would give me a zero from the sine v. And then here's sine u cos u, the cosine of pi over two is zero. So that slot would be zero. So checking at this point, I get a normal that goes four, zero, zero. I get a normal that's coming outwards. So this parameterization is outward normals. But the normals have different magnitudes. Here the normal magnitude is four. Here the normal magnitude is zero. Now that might bother you for a second, but I want, I'll let you think about that. If my normal right there is zero, then I'll be dotting f dot zero. I will measure no contribution through the North Pole. I'll let you think about what that means, but I'm confident I'm talking about outward normal here. So now let's assemble the integral. F substitute the parameterization. The, I'm sorry, partial R partial U, my normal representative, partial R partial V. Dotting those two. And DA with respect to the U and V of the region R. So let's take this and insert it into the field. I gotta go back and look at what our field was. Where was our field? Where was our field? Oh, here's our field. So it's hard to shift papers here. This is starting to look unpleasant, but that's what we kind of wanted, a hard exercise in trig functions possibly. So the y minus two x is this slot minus two of that slot. So that is two sine u sine v minus four, sine u cosine v, that's y minus two x. Then in the second slot, x cubed minus y, that's ridiculous. Eight sine cubed u cosine cubed v minus y two sine u sine v. Sorry, there's too much distance between the top and bottom. And what I'll just read this field to myself. The third slot was y squared minus z. And y squared minus z will be four sine squared u sine v also squared. 
and minus z we minus two cos u. That's just plugging the parameterization into the field. Well, this seems like a bad pass, doesn't it? I want to check this and just see what the final integral result is. So I'm going to double check my work here before I take this any further to make not worse thing than I have to. This was the y, the two sine u sine v. This was the subtract two x's, which is minus four sine u cos v. This was unfortunate cubing x, eight sine u cubed cosine v cubed, subtracting y, which was two sine u sine v. This was x cubed minus y. This part right here was y squared minus z, which is four sine squared sine squared minus two cos u. Okay, so that's good. And now I got to dot it with what? I got to dot it with my normal, which was also full of stuff. Sine squared u cosine v, four sine squared u sine v, and four sine u sine v. This is my outward normal. And I'll evaluate it with respect to A. What I'm expecting to happen here, and this is why I'm looking at this, is I'm expecting to happen lots of powers of sines and cosines, but I expect also some things to collapse or simplify. So let me just write down what this dot product yields, and then we'll decide whether we want to pursue it. So when I multiply the first slots together, I'll get eight sine cubed u sine v cosine v, eight sine cubed u sine v cosine v. But don't forget, I also have this times that, which is 16 negative sine cubed u cosine squared v. OK, good. And now we'll do this slot times that, which is also two pieces times this. So this is plus 32 sine fifth u sine v cos cubed v And this is minus eight sine cubed u sine squared v. And then last, so I got both of those pieces in there. And then lastly is this piece times this piece, which again is two pieces. Give me a 16 sine cubed u sine cubed v, if we're reading that correctly, and then a minus eight, sine u cos u sine v, sine u cos u sine v, du dv. Now remember u and v, v was going from zero to two pi, u is going from zero to pi. So I think I have to take this and zoom out a little bit. I apologize for that. See if I can get the whole thing on the paper more or less. The only hope I have of evaluating this is I'm gonna get some benefits from the full period and half period over u and v. So for example, with respect to V, I see right here sine V cos V, which is trig identity two sine V. I'm sorry, one half sine two V. Sine two V is two sine V cos V. So sine V cos V is one half sine two V. That means a sine wave of amplitude half 
and two waves in two pi units. So this is two full waves of a sine wave in two pi units. The amplitude is not important. Whoops. Sorry, I just dropped you. Now, what did that amount to? That amounted to my clamp failing here. Hang on. Are you okay? okay. Sorry about that. I guess this clamp is not as reliable as my other construction. But what I'm saying is this piece has to make a zero contribution in the V integral. You say, well, you haven't done the U integral yet, but the U integral is gonna evaluate to a number. There's no improperness here. So this portion is gonna be zero. Let's cruise through and see if we can find anyone else like that. Same thing right here, this sine V or either this sine U cos U, which would represent a factor of sine two u, sine two u, that would be one period of sine over zero to pi with respect to u, or I could take the sine v, which is one period of sine over zero to two pi with respect to v. It doesn't matter which one I integrate first, that's gone. So that means I've already made this shorter. Let's write down what I've made shorter. So now I have sine squared, sine cubed u cos squared v. Now I'm gonna say, do I get any benefits from other things like possibly trig identities? Plus 32 sine fifth u sine v cos cubed v. And then this one, minus eight sine cubed u sine squared v. There's a little action right there. And then I have 16 sine cubed u sine cubed v. So I have common factors here and there like the sine cubed u, all right, here's another sine cubed u here. And when I factored that out, I have other pieces attached to that. I might look at that or zero to two pi, or this might not be worth examining at all but it has to resolve itself to minus 128 pi over three, because that's the answer I got from the other side of Gauss's theorem. I'm just thinking about how much time to invest in this. I could focus on the sine cubed as a common term, even though I don't have the same coefficient across each one. Could almost make the same coefficient. And I'll show you what I mean by that, because I could turn these 16s into eights with a proper identity in here or here. Do I have anything to take this fourth term to compare it to? Oh, I have a sine v, cos v. I mean, I have powers of sine and cosine that I again should examine right here. Like you should ask, well, what does 32 sine fifth u look like with respect to zero to pi? That's not a full wave of sine u raised to the fifth power, but it might still be a useful number, right? So do I have any simplification in V from zero to two pi from this piece. That's a full wave of sine and a full wave of cosine cubed. So if I looked at that from zero to two pi, I suspect that this net contribution would be zero here. So I'm wondering 
that this contribution is going to be zero here. Let's factor out the sine cubed on the other three and see what I can see. Since eight is the smallest number I have, I'm going to factor out a minus eight sine cubed u and be left with what? Two cos squared v. one sine squared v and minus two sine cubed v. I'm just looking at these three pieces here. This is not sine squared plus cosine squared equals one, and I kind of regret that, but I could pull a one out of here I could say sine squared plus cosine squared with one cosine squared left over. So I'd call this one plus cosine squared V like that. Here, I don't get to subtract anything immediately useful, but I could use a reduction formula on the powers of sine. I don't see any great simplification here. Although I can work on powers of sine and cosine in my integral, because there are reduction formulas I can use there. I don't see any superior way to evaluate this without doing a lot of scratch work, which is not a good use of our time. Maybe I should just be appreciating the shortcut that Gauss's theorem gave me and the minus 128 pi over three. If you like, see if you can finish processing this integral. And my camera has fallen too close to the table again. See if you can finish processing the surface integral and see if I have something useful to report from here. See if another parameterization would be more functional. You should, and let me, warn you about this. Let me fix my camera before it falls over again. Sorry. You should, if you have some time, investigate the powers of sine and cosine over a full half interval and so forth. Because remember what I reported to you that one bump of sine or even one bump of cosine, straight sine or cosine, any one of these bumps has an area of two. And then you could take that and say, what happens to the sine of 2x? One bump of the sine of 2x would be from instead of 0 to pi, 0 to pi over 2. That would be squeezing this bump down, having it on the x-axis. You could check that area by direct calculation as 1 half. But you could also ask the other way. What if I put the two on the power and evaluate it from zero to pi? So what's the area under sine squared x from zero to pi? Now pay attention to that. Sine squared x, anything that's near zero gets closer to zero when you square it. Anything that's near one stays near one when you square it. So sine squared x, you could evaluate on a graphing looks like this. So it's kind of a pinched version of that mound, or it's actually by the trig identities, one half minus one half cos two x, double angle identity. It's actually an upside down cosine wave of a halved period raised by a half unit. What's the area that's in there? Is there a standard way to express the area that's in there? 
And you do that with that substitution. So I'm off on a tangent here, but I'm just gonna finish what I do here. Zero to pi, this produces no net contribution here, but this one half will produce a pi over two. And then you can go to the reduction formulas and see what factors you keep adding in front of here. So what I'm saying is there are simple ways to evaluate powers of sine and cosine over common links, zero to two pi, zero to pi, zero to pi over two. So you don't need to avoid doing those calculations. But I want you to examine this and see if you can come up with a minus 128 pi. Maybe it'd be a good exercise. Maybe it'd be a good test question. But I don't see anything here unless we carefully examine this and I don't want to use that time right now. Let's see if we can find out just one more example and run this here. So, so far we've only seen Gauss's theorem helping us get out of surface integrals. Um, integrating over a cube, 402, 403. You should pay attention to that because cube give you surface faces that point only in one direction vector. And so that's naturally something you can simplify flex over. I want to see what problem I gave you on the homework. I think I gave you a problem with homework with a cube, 402 alt. So maybe I should do something of a cube here. Let's look at 403 really quickly. Maybe this will help you visualize what you're doing in 402. Okay, so here we got field. And the field is x cubed minus 3y, 2yz plus 1 and x, y, z. And the cube, the solid G is bounded by the three pairs of planes, x equals plus minus one, y equals plus minus one, z equals plus minus one. So what does it mean to calculate flux of that field through the boundary of the solid G? I'll share this notation with you because sometimes you see this in books or old books. You use a, this wiggly D and partial derivatives. Sometimes people use that notation to stand for the boundary of a solid. I haven't seen him present that in this book, but instead of naming the boundary S, we can name the boundary del G or partial G. Now, I do fully expect still that the divergence is going to be easier to calculate than the surface integral. But the surface integral with these planes is going to have very simple normals. So I got a cube sitting right here. That's plus minus one on the x-axis, plus minus one on the y-axis. 
and plus minus one on the Z axis. That's a little too crude of a drawing, but it's a cube centered at the origin and the side length is two. Notice the normals from each of those faces are either I minus I, J minus J or K minus K. That could make this surface integral calculation significantly simpler. But I don't think this field is showing me any symmetry necessarily. If these were strictly X, Y, and Z in some of these slots or a simpler mixture of X, Y, and Z, I might be able to take advantage of those simpler normals. But let's look at the divergence integral at least first. We calculate the divergence on this and we get 3x squared plus second slot with respect to y, 2z plus third slot with respect to z, x, y. So this is interesting. This will be a non-trivial integral with respect to volume dx, dy, dz. Unfortunately, the limits in x, y, and z are going to be simple each time. Minus 1 to 1, minus 1 to 1, minus 1 to 1. But I'm not going to get away with just calling this the volume of that cube. So I'm going to have to integrate with respect to x, y, and z here. With respect to x, going to give me a x cubed plus 2xz plus 1 half x squared y. But between minus 1 and 1, what's that going to give me? 1 plus 2z plus half y. And do I get any simplification with a minus one? I get one small piece of simplification, a minus one, a minus two Z, and a still positive one half Y. So I get the Y pieces to cancel out because I have one half Y minus one half Y, but the other pieces will double. I have two plus four Z. Now I do dy dz. So minus one to one, minus one to one. And integrating this with respect to y, since this is constant with respect to y, I just get two plus four z times y. And y ranges from minus one to two. This is an interval of length two. So this is just four plus eight z. Dz integral from minus one to one. And I guess I'll take this over here for lack of space. 4z plus 4z squared. Integrate with respect to z minus 1 to 1. And so I have 4 plus 4. Subtract, and some simplification, minus 4 plus 4. So these two fours cancel out four minus four, but here's four minus negative four is eight. So I visualize that the flux of this field through the surface of this cube is eight. I wonder how bad it would be to calculate the flux through those six boundaries. I'm not attracted to that because even though the parameterizations would be simple and the unit normals would be simple, field is not got a lot of symmetry in it. Let's say that the boundary of G is the six faces of this cube. S1, S2, S3, S4, S5, S6. And let's at least calculate one of them. 
let's call S1. this forward facing cube, this front of the cube, which points with a unit normal along the positive x-axis. I'm gonna move my paper, excuse me. I'm gonna count this correctly. And let's at least parameterize one of these to see what benefit I would get from those nice normals. So a nicer picture of the cube from one to minus one, one to minus one, one to minus one. And what I get right here That's not necessarily a nicer picture of the cube. But let's concentrate on this front face. Let's call this front face S1. Parameterize S1. Let's parameterize it straight ahead with U and V being the variation in the Y and Z portion and X being constantly one because that's the front face. U represent the Y coordinate, V represent the Z coordinate, then U and V are both ranging from minus one to one. The normal of this is gonna be easy to calculate because partial R partial U is zero, one, zero. Partial R partial V is zero, zero, one. So partial R partial U cross partial R partial V turns out to be one zero zero, which is outward with respect to my cube, right? So that's heading outward from this front face like that. But let's see if I get any benefit from this simple normal and this simple presentation of face number one. Partial R, partial U, partial R, partial V, D, U, D, V. And I've already advanced to integrating over the region for R. R1 over S1 here. So insert this into the field and I'm not gonna bring the sheet down and look at the field, I'll just insert it for you. One minus three U's, two times Y times Z is two times U times V plus one. And then X times Y times Z is one times U times V is UV. The only benefit I get right here is my normal is only going to pick up the first slot of this expression. So I get integral over R1. That's the normal on the front face. I get integral over R1, 1 minus 3u du dv. And the U and V were both going from minus one to one. There's no V in this integral. So with respect to V, I'll just be multiplying two times this quantity. And that's a shortcut you have to be comfortable with. And then evaluate this from minus one to one, two U minus three U squared. What do I get is two minus three, negative one. When I plug in the negative one, I get negative two minus three. Keep track of all my negative signs. Negative one plus five 
This turns out to be four. And my clamp is slowly failing. So that's it for Walmart clamps. Let me see if I can get one more minute out of this. I apologize. I'll go back to my old technology. So what I have is four is the flux outward through this face. But the question is, how do I do the rest of the faces? Well, I could use a similar parameterization for the back just by setting this equal to minus one. But notice at that time, I'd have a normal that's going inward because the normal would still be one, one, zero. If I had a minus one, it would change what I have in these reporting slots here. But I'd still only pick up the first slot. So the result of that, let's say if I imagine that that was a minus one there, can we just visualize this? Then this would be minus one here. And that is the only slot I care about. So if I'm talking about S2 is the back wall, I'll take the walls in pairs. Then the integral over R2 would be minus one minus three U du dv. This would be set at one, that's inward. If I want to make it outward, I could change it to a minus one. But let's just do this integral right here. Minus one, one, minus one, one. Minus one, minus three u, u dv. This would still be multiplying by two over the venus of this, minus two minus three u squared. It'll only be barely different than that from minus one to one, du minus two u minus, sorry, this is minus two minus six u. I was integrating and multiplying at the same time. So this is minus two u minus three u squared. That matches that. And I go from minus one to one. And what do we get here? Negative two minus three, there's a negative five. And here we get positive two minus three, it's negative one. So here we get negative four. But this was respect to an inward normal. So the field flowing out of there is positive for both front and back. So notice I already have a flux over S1 plus S2. Of eight, which was what my divergence calculation said to me. So does that mean the flux out of the other four faces is zero. No, it means the net flux out of the other four faces is zero. So maybe there's something in the field I can use to determine that. But I'm a little bit uncomfortable doing that so quickly. You could consider practicing on the other four faces and seeing if when you sum all six faces, you stay here at eight. But Gauss's theorem has already calculated the net flux from the whole cube from us. So I'm not overly concerned about it. I would just do the other four faces for practice. Sorry, let me move this paper up there. So Gauss's theorem was more or less a straight ahead time saver for doing surface integrals. Surface integrals do seem to be the ones that require the most work because you have to construct these parameterizations. Okay, I have to cut this off and get rid of this camera, but I am going to online office hours between 10 and 11. I won't stay in this room. You can go back to our webpage and click on the online office link if you want to visit those in this next hour, but I'm gonna end this so that I can record, get uh, have the recording saved and posted. 
and then we'll move on to our review next week. Thank you.